Today is the second Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tuba. And the Sunday Gospels of the Blessed Month of Tuba deal with baptism as a mean of salvation. We talk about salvation as a theme. <clears throat> why? Because why is baptism going to be a running theme in this month? Because we just celebrated a couple of days ago uh, the, fe the Feast of Theophany or Epiphany. And it's a, really one of the most important feasts that we can celebrate in the church. It's second to the resurrection. I know nativity has a lot of uh, focus, but actually theophany is, is, is technically kind of a bigger deal than nativity. And we talked about that on the Feast of Theophany. And so the second Sunday reminds us that those who follow in deed and in word will receive salvation, and this comes through uh, baptism. There's three elements of the gospel passage today that I want to focus on today. Number one is the need to obey the word of God. Number two, the need to believe in the resurrection of Christ. And number three, the need to reflect the light of Christ. We're going to talk about each one of these. So after the Lord, this, so this gospel passage comes from the gospel of St. Luke chapter 11. And right before this, which is not mentioned today, earlier in the verses, our Lord casts out a demon and explained that Satan cannot cast out Satan. And a woman praised St. Mary, and he, she praised the Lord and St. Mary by saying in verse 47 of today, To the blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, as a response, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That was kind of the series of events that led to the beginning of the gospel passage for today. We picked it up on Luke chapter 11, verse 27. So one internal reflection that I hope that we have today is, do we obey the word of God? Sometimes we focus on, and, and the focus here is on the heart more than the body. And it looks like that woman admired the words of God. She reacted by lifting up her voice and praising the Lord. And she said a blessing and, and, and blessing the womb that bore him and the breast that nursed him. But our Lord refused that St. Mary would only be blessed by giving birth, like that was her only good deed, that she gave birth, and, and therefore she should be blessed. No, she should also be blessed by truly being united with the Lord because she heard the word, accepted it, and lived it to the fullness. That's why she's blessed. St. Augustine says, St. Mary was more blessed in accepting the faith of Christ then in conceiving the flesh of Christ, even her maternal relationship would have done St. Mary no good unless she had borne Christ more happily in her heart than in her flesh. St. Mary is not honored solely based on the fact that she physically gave birth and nurtured Christ. She is honored because she heard the word and she kept it. It is her life of being completely surrendered to the will of God, that's why she's honored. Although giving birth to Christ is St. Mary's own unique experience, her example of submission can be followed by all of us, all of us Christian who claim to be Christian. But we have to reflect on our reaction. Our reaction when we hear scripture or a sermon the question is, how do we keep it? How do we keep it in our lives and within ourselves, in our hearts? What's our response? We have, I think, been affected deeply by a lot of sermons. We hear a lot of sermons, I hope. I hope we hear a lot of sermons. And we have reacted like this woman. Maybe it's like a brief reaction. Maybe in the moment of that sermon, we're like, yes. Yes, Abuna, that sounds good. And we feel like we want to say something. We might even nudge the person next to us and say, listen, listen up, this is for you. We shouldn't do that. But, you know, we have, this, we have this reaction. The word is not like what you hear from ordinary people, but the word of God feeds you true food. It's alive within you, and it bears fruit to do what is pleasing to God. Christ is our gift and our model, and we must both be believe and love and then imitate. St. Augustine says, if we really love, then we will imitate. 
How do we know where our heart and our mind is? It's our mouth, one, one aspect of that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In the Catholic epistle today, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. He urges us to cling to the word of God to keep it safe in our heart. And so our Lord, this first aspect of today, our Lord was teaching that an essential element of salvation is obedience to the word of God. We must obey the word of God fully and not just pick and choose which portions of the word of God that we like to obey or we like to dismiss. We obey all of God's word. The second aspect of today or the question that I want us to contemplate is, do we believe in the resurrection of Christ? In verse 29, again from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 11, verse 29, it says, While the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. So the sign of Jonah it's probably like a twofold meaning. There's probably two aspects of why he said Jonah of all people. Let's, let's maybe unpack the first meaning possibly. The death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. So our Lord mentions Jonah because Jonah's three days in the belly of the, of the fish is, and then he's released by the command of God are a sign of Jesus rising from the dead on the third day. This is mentioned specifically in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 40. So Jonah sank to the bottom of the sea and was swallowed by a great fish and spit out onto dry land, and he proclaimed God's message to the people of Nineveh, or the land of Nineveh. Jonah never actually died. It's a spiritual death. Those who were thrown in the sea might as well have been dead. So it's a spiritual death. Although his ordeal certainly should have killed him, apart from God's miraculous intervention, however, our Lord himself underwent a real death, a real burial, and a real resurrection. This is what distinguishes him from Jonah, among a lot of other things. The resurrection of Christ was the core of the gospel message preached by the apostles, from the beginning. And so Jonah illustrates and foreshadows the burial and the resurrection of Christ himself. That's one aspect of why Christ might have said no other sign is needed except for Jonah. The other aspect could have been, the second meaning could have been, the need for true repentance. So just as the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, this, this flawed prophet, and the people repented. They truly repented from the least of them to the greatest. This signified the need for the audience of our Lord Jesus Christ to also respond to the message of the gospel with repentance. The sign of Jonah is to call to repent. So putting this twofold meaning together. The sign of Jonah that our Lord preaches today in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 is the preaching of the risen Lord. No other sign is necessary to provide sufficient reason to repent and to believe because Christ is the greatest sign that God will ever give. Some of us are searching for that, for that sign specifically to each one of us. We're looking for a sign. We, we, we pray that the heavens part and God reveals himself specifically to me and then I'll truly believe. Some of us have this doubt within us. It's okay. But we might get really frustrated with that experience. Our Lord is very clear with this response. No other sign is needed except for what happened to Jonah. Jonah. So we might be holding our breath for a very long time, waiting for Christ himself to reveal himself to us. No other sign will be given. Maybe. So 
Just as once, long ago, Jonah had been God's sign to the people of Nineveh, so now Christ was God's sign to them. And the problem is they failed to recognize him. When Solomon was king, the queen of Sheba recognized his wisdom, and she came from very, very far to benefit from it. When Jonah preached, the people of Nineveh recognized the authentic voice of God, and they responded to it. In the day of judgment, these people would rise up and condemn the Jews of our Lord's time because the Jews had an opportunity and a privilege far beyond anything they had ever had it, had it before, and they refused to accept it. The condemnation of the Jews would be all more severe because their privileges and their access was just so great. Two things strike me about our Lord's use of the Ninevites and the Queen of the South. <clears throat> the first is they're both Gentiles. And they, because of their belief and their faith, will condemn the unbelief of this generation of Gentiles, of, of Israelites. The second is that both parties believed with a lot less evidence than that this generation has seen. The Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. And if we really study the book of Jonah, he's a, he's a, a perfect example of, of an imperfect prophet. He had many flaws, and yet the people responded to him. He said in his, in his book, in the book of Jonah, in his great sermon, I'm being sarcastic. He says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will perish. That's it. That's all we know. That's all that's recorded. This great sermon of Jonah. The, the people of Nineveh was a great city. Huge in number. And all the people repented at this sermon. Let me say it again. In 40 days, Nineveh will perish. That's it. And their response was so huge. There's not a lot of evidence. There's not a lot of data behind his sermon. Not a lot of theological unpacking. And all we know from Jonah, when he spoke these words in a way that it wasn't really meant to convince or convert these people, he didn't like them. He didn't like the Ninevites. But the Ninevites nonetheless believed. The Queen of the South was also convinced that the wisdom of Solomon when she heard his words. We have the privilege of possessing the Bible. And that privilege is a responsibility that we have to answer for. We have the freedom to worship as we think is right. And that too is a privilege that will cost the lives of of men and women. The tragedy is that so many people have used that freedom in order to not worship at all. And that too is a responsibility that we will have to answer for. The third aspect of today's gospel. Do we reflect the light of Christ? Do we reflect the light of Christ? And again, gospel of Luke chapter 11, verse 34, we read, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. The meaning is not so easy to grasp, but it's most likely this. The light of the body depends on the eye. If the eye is healthy, the body receives all the light it needs. When the eye is unhealthy, this light turns into darkness. And so the people around Christ were complaining about insufficient evidence. They were seeking a sign. But our Lord turned the tables, blaming them for their lack of spiritual sight. The problem is not with the light of Christ that he gives to us. That's not the problem. That's not the issue. It's a me problem. The problem is with the people's eyes. <clears throat> 
They cannot see the light of Christ because perhaps they are full of darkness. And then and what happens beyond this gospel passage, it happens in verse 36 to 41. Our Lord illustrates what a person looks like who thinks they see Christ, but actually is full of darkness. It's a certain Pharisee who asked to dine with him. And then he says in verse 39 and 40, it's not part of the gospel today. He says, the Lord said to them, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness, foolish ones. He goes on to say, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. We know these, we know these passages, hopefully. So our Lord said, this is the problem when there is the eye is, when the eye is full of darkness, when the eye is unclean or unhealthy. We don't need more light, is the point. We need to respond in faith to the sufficient light that's already given to us. What our Lord has done in plain sight should be enough to satisfy. We need good eyes to see Christ for who he is, not for what we want him to be. When a person has good eyes, his whole body will be filled with light and he will shine brightly, free from the presence of darkness. So we need to ask God to clear our spiritual sight. The eye, our Lord said, is the gateway to the person's entire being, his whole body. If the eye is good, if it lets in the light, the whole body will be illuminated. If the eye is defective, if it lets in a little bit of light, then the whole body is dark. So, when we move from the symbolism to substance of the argument, our Lord is saying that everyone who failed to interpret the evidence of the miracle that was happening as they should have done is because of the defect of their ability to see the truth. It's not because of a deficiency in the evidence. It's a me problem. So, let's put these things together. Let's conclude. We have to examine ourselves to see if the evidence of these essential, these essential aspects of salvation is present in our lives. Do we obey the word of God? Do we believe in the resurrection of Christ? Do we reflect the light of Christ? I suggest that we take very deliberate steps to do what God calls us to do. In the book of James, it says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't sit there in a sermon and say, Yes, for a moment. And we're not really keeping it in our hearts. It would be foolish to walk into a dark room, turn on the lights, so that you can see all the obstacles in front of you and then walk into the obstacles. That would be foolish. The whole point of turning on the light is to enable you to alter your steps the best way that you can to find the least dangerous pathway. The same is true for the word of God. To take in the light of the scripture and then to ignore its wisdom then we live our lives as foolishness. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, like, why is it so, why is there so much trouble in obeying? Why do we have such a hard time obeying? Is it because we don't think that God knows what he's talking about? Is it because we really believe that our situation is, is specific and unique? Do we just not get it? Are we simply rebellious kids, sons and daughters of God? May I make a suggestion? We need to move in God's direction. We have to make progress towards the goal, 
The goal is Christ. The goal is not necessarily like keeping track of how many prayers you had this month. Or the goal is not specifically how many chapters or books of the Bible that you read this month. No, the goal is Christ. The goal is Christ. How much we fast in a specific month. That's not the goal. These are disciplines to get us closer to our goal. The goal is Christ. One way I heard it said is, <clears throat> if you think of God's standard as 10 of the holiness scale, and maybe we see ourselves at 1, or like me, like minus 5, right? You're at negative 5 on the continuum, and the goal is 10 of God's holiness. Instead of getting discouraged and giving up because you can't get to 10, we set a goal of making progress, of struggle. It's the struggle that matters. When you are at one, struggle to two, whatever that means. When you are at negative five, like me, we try to get to negative four. The goal is to make progress. The goal is to struggle. The goal is Christ. God will help you if you sincerely want to follow him. Underline sincerely. It will take time for you to change your focus and our behaviors. And I'm not suggesting that you lower God's standard to meet you where you are. I'm suggesting that we develop a reasonable plan of change with your father confession no matter how old you are. This becomes a big challenge, guys, when we get older. We make a lot of excuses for ourselves, our busy schedules. we got to take care of the kids. I have a busy work schedule. I have to answer emails. When can I have time to meet with a woman? And really, it's not so bad. Like, I'm not sitting like that guy. It becomes a struggle when we're older. We're so hyper-focused on making sure that our kids are, are regular on their confession schedule. This is good. We have to look inwards. We have to look in ourselves. We make excuses. We say, but Abuna, is, my, my father confession is so far away. It's very difficult to find an appointment with him. The light is available. God wants you to see clearly. And the reality is a day of judgment is coming. And on that day, no one will be able to use the excuse that they didn't understand what God had desired because it was dark. Those who end up in hell will not be there because they did not understand. They will be there because they refused to turn on the light. In other words, where you spend eternity is directly connected to how you respond to Christ and his word right now. We pray that we take the example of St. Mary by always keeping and obeying the word of God in our hearts. We pray that God makes our eyes good and heal our spiritual blindness. And we pray that we are not to be just as a candle lit in the face of overwhelming darkness. No, more than that, that we are, we are like the sun which overwhelms the darkness and brings light to every nook and cranny in the world as well as in our hearts. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are